Good morning, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Lung cancer remains the leading cause of cancer death in adults. There are four main histological types of cancer, adenocarcinoma being the most common, squamous cell cancer, large cell carcinoma, and small cell undifferentiated carcinoma. Not all lung masses are primary lung cancers. Greater than 70% are multiple, of multiple lung nodules represent metastatic lesions. I'd like to, in this lecture, cover the various subtopics and hope to take you through each of them briefly. Consent, as in any interventional radiology procedure, is an essential part to explain to the patient what the procedure is, including its complications. And within the complications, I think it's important to discuss pneumothorax, because that's common, hemorrhage, hemoptysis, sepsis, a potential failure of the result and maybe a need to repeat. I do not routinely speak about air embolism or death, which can occur but which are very rare. We need to go through the complete diagnostic evaluation first, clinical and laboratory findings. So if you look at the absolute contraindications for lung biopsies, this will include a patient who would refuse the biopsy a patient who's got deranged platelets and, in, uh, and coagulation status with an INR more than 2, perhaps a 1.5 is taken to be a standard. Lesions that are very small, less than 5 millimeters, can be tricky and difficult. And cases, importantly, cases where a tissue diagnosis will not alter the clinical management for the patient. Relative contraindications include those patients who have large bully. These will increase the risk of a pneumothorax. And all these actually increase the risk of the procedure. P patients with previous pneumonectomy or single lung, because if they get a pneumothorax or bleeding, they're in trouble. Severe emphysema, this, again, these group of patients may not tolerate a pneumothorax, or those that have coexisting contralateral pneumothorax. So these are all relative contraindications. CT now, as the chairman has said, it's the main choice to guide lung biopsies, although there are other imaging modalities as well both for fine needle aspiration and coaxial cutting needle techniques. Why is CT good? Because it gives us great pre-procedure needle trajectory planning, and you can use that to risk minimize the procedure. The needle guidance is accurate, and unless you're using CT fluoroscopy, it's not usually in real time. CT fluoroscopy will help you with that, but it increases the radiation risk. CT is also great because it will give you an immediate detection of post-biopsy complication, and if need be, you can use this for therapeutic drainage immediately after. So how I do it? There's a lesion in the left lower lobe. We place the patient prone. We put markers here to sign to help us direct the direction. In this particular plane, the we have to traverse a larger amount of lung and perhaps a more oblique approach. You can turn the patient a little bit to their side to reduce the amount of lung you have to go through. And you can even look to turn them decubitus. And then you see you have a direct target perpendicular to you with the least amount of lung you need to go through. Standard practice will be involving a coaxial needle, which you take through the pleura so you don't cut across the pleural surface and you minimize the number of punctures across the pleural surface. You then open your throw of your biopsy needle. Across the lesion, you confirm your imposition, and then you take a post-biopsy picture as well to make sure there are no immediate complications. Fluoroscopy was previously used for guidance of needle biopsy, and all of us in the past did most of our biopsies under fluoroscopy. You could do AP and lateral approaches, and they're very good. But CT now has become, especially for the smaller size lesions, much more important. Ultrasound, as the chairman had shown you, is also useful for the biopsy of subpleural lesions, and also where you want continuous real-time nature of imaging. But it's not good at all for biopsying an intraparenchymal lung lesion, because ultrasound cannot penetrate the aerated lung as well. PET scan is very helpful, and I do support getting a PET scan prior to a biopsy, 
particularly if you have a non-diagnostic biopsy in the first time. And then prior to repeating your biopsy, if you get a PET scan, it can help you optimize the site of biopsy. I'll give you an example here. A patient who's got a lesion in the left upper lobe. When you do a PET scan, you see that the hot part of the activity in this lesion is more inferiorly, more medially, and then you can target your needle better to sample that area which is likely to give you a better result. Most patients for lung biopsies will have the procedure under local anesthetic and sedation. It's very unusual to need general anesthetic. And more importantly as well, it's important to explain to the patient what you're going to do. If they know what they're going to get, what they're expecting, they cooperate much better. Post biopsy, it's important to have bed rest. Initially, it's advisable to have the patient on the ipsilateral side down. This will help reduce further hemorrhage or the pneumothorax enlarging. Then you can place the patient supine at 45 degrees, continuous oxygen saturation monitoring. It's important to monitor the pulse and blood pressures. And I think more importantly, it's patients should be in a dedicated recovery unit where they are being monitored. Some operators would perform a chest x-ray at four hours, but now because most lesions are done under CT guidance, you will know immediately if there's a problem. And many reserve a chest x-ray just prior to discharge or if the patients have any symptoms. Most lung biopsies are now performed as a day case. And inpatient biopsies are reserved only for those patients who are unfit or they've received or they've developed a complication from the biopsy. I think it's important that clinicians and interventional radiologists should be available in the event of a late complication, such as the delayed pneumothorax, hemoptysis, and patients being informed of such potential complications and the importance of them returning to the hospital. Clinic follow-up should also be performed where biopsy result is available to determine further management should there be a need to repeat, and patients should be given mild oral analgesia. And when there is a, re- when there's a non-diagnostic uh, biopsy, then a repeat biopsy can be arranged. Sometimes the route to the lesion can be difficult, and there are other techniques that are available, such as iatrogenic pneumothorax creations or saline window techniques to help open the window, particularly for mediastinal, posterior mediastinal lesions. If we go through the complications now, pneumothorax is one of the commonest complications for a lung biopsy. It has been shown that the lesion depth is an important factor in predicting a pneumothorax. With subpleural lesions less than two centimeters from the pleura, more likely to result in a pneumothorax. Also, if you cross more number of pleural surfaces or you biopsy across a pleural surface, then there's a likely higher incidence of a pneumothorax. It is advised to use smaller caliber needles, 20 gauge, 18 gauge, to reduce the risk and also to try and biopsy perpendicularly across the pleura rather than obliquely, so you're cutting across the smaller surface of the pleura. Some reports have also suggested plugging the biopsy or injecting a blood patch, an example here of a BioC lung plug system. It is not a system we routinely use in the UK, however. If you do have a pneumothorax, having a coaxial needle technique is very helpful because like In this image here, if you see a pneumothorax following the biopsy, you can retract your coaxial needle into the plane of the pneumothorax and then aspirate. And if there's further uh, compromised respiratory, you can even place a percutaneous drain. It has been shown in a publication in CVIR previously that if you're aspirating about 700 mils of air at that stage, you may decide, look, we're better off putting a chest drain or performing a blood patch. Chest drains can be placed at standard rocket chest drains. In my unit, we prefer to place a pigtail catheter in which we do a Saldinga technique, and we connect that to an underwater seal, as shown in this x-ray here. For bleeding, the lesion depth again is an important factor in predicting bleeding. This time, lesions greater than two centimeters deep result in a higher risk of parenchymal hemorrhage or hemoptysis because most of the vessels or the larger size vessels are more central than peripheral. Lesion size, even lesions that are smaller than two centimeters, 
they've shown to be a predictor because you're more likely to cut across normal adjacent aerated lung and therefore you'll have a higher risk of bleeding. Bleeding rates are also seen to be higher with fine needle biops uh, with core biopsies rather than fine needle aspiration. And bleeding is the commonest cause of death from a lung biopsy. How we can avoid bleeding, CT again will help us. You can delineate the adjacent vessels, plan the trajectory so that you avoid crossing any large vessels. You avoid sampling normal lung whenever you can, so you adjust the throw of your needle. If it's a two centimeter throw and the lesion is small, then throw with a one centimeter. Avoid performing biopsies with any abnormal coagulation. And if there's known pulmonary arterial hypertension, consider uh, avoiding the biopsy. Most episodes of parenchyma hemorrhage or hemoptysis settle spontaneously. It's important to reassure the patient, and just like in the consent, it's important to explain to the patient that they, this can occur so they do not get very apprehensive when this does happen, and tell them that it does settle. Place the patient in a decubitus position on the ipsilateral side down that helps to tamponade the bleeding, and consider antibiotic therapy and physiotherapy to reduce infection afterwards. If, however, the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable, we would have to then start the appropriate fluid resuscitation, may need a blood transfusion. It's very unusual to progress to bronchial or pulmonary artery transcatheter embolization, but this should be in uh, preparation and should be available. If you have to ventilate, remind the anesthetist they're well aware of this, that they should do that with a split endotracheal tube. It helps protect the normal lung uh, from cross flow of blood and then occlusion. And you can consider giving tranexamic acid in hemoptysis patients. That does help, and we would do that as well in my unit. Luckily, air embolism is a rare complication. It is, can be symptomatic and can be asymptomatic, but when it is, it is a very, can be fatal. And it occurs when you puncture a vessel with air being sucked in. And the symptoms that can occur resemble those of stroke, transient ischemic attacks, seizures, or cardiopulmonary collapse. How we can avoid this is by avoiding puncturing a vessel in the first place, placing a finger over the outer guidance needle to prevent air being sucked in, putting your coaxial stilet back in straight away as you're taking the biopsy specimen out. If an air embolism does occur and the patient does become symptomatic, Consider placing the patient immediately into a left lateral decubitus position or the Trendelenburg position. Administer 100% oxygen. These maneuvers help to place the, lung, the air within the right heart and prevent it going into the left side. In severe cases, hyperbaric oxygen therapy may be recommended. And a diagnosis can be established by CT. We've looked at potential complications, and you can avoid these complications if you study the anatomy and are aware of it. For example, for anterior mediastinal masses, remember the internal mammary vessels are very uh, adjacent to the sternum, so you can guide your needle either lateral or medial to this to avoid them. And similarly, if you're biopsying something in the posterior mediastinum or the middle mediastinum, you should be well comfortable with the anatomy. Some tips. Uh, for CT biopsies now. We can do the biopsy in inspiration, in expiration, or shallow breathing. They all work equally well. Just be sure what you are doing and let the patient know what you expect for them as well during those biopsy maneuvers. For lung bases, I find gentle expiration, breath held to be more useful. And I use CT fluoroscopy not routinely, but I reserve it for small lesions which are subpleural or that which they are close to the extreme claustrophenic angles. And if you have a subdural lesion, then I tend to put a more oblique root if I can't get a perpendicular root into them. As I explained earlier on, try and stay in an axial plane as much as possible. It helps to keep the needle straight, and you can see what you're doing as well. A decubitus position may help move breasts, for example, out of the way so it's easier access to traverse soft tissues as well. And now for med uh, mediastinal biopsies, more or less, it's exclusively become and taken over by EBUS. The risks are minimized uh, so that we don't have to undertake CT biopsies. And through EBUS, they are very good at it now. Very rarely will they not get samples. 
So as I mentioned earlier on, it's important to adjust the pre set of your needle. These needles very much can give you a one centimeter throw or a two centimeter throw. You can use that to adjust to avoid normal lung tissue, avoid bronchial or vascular structures with that. And you can increase the tissue yield obtained from a coaxial biopsy by taking multiple biopsies, rotating the biopsies, and if need be, you can even bend the tip of the biopsy needle uh, or angulate it slightly so it helps you take a sample from a superior and then an inferior aspect through the coaxial needles. I'd like to share some cases with you just to explain some of these complications that incur. One patient who had a PET positive right upper lobe lesion. We're targeting this under CT guidance in the prone position. You see some alveolar hemorrhage there in the parenchyma. It's not unusual. Uh, this patient did not have any hemoptysis, and this is all we saw, and it settled. Another patient with a right-sided lesion was suspicious for squamous cell carcinoma. Initially, it was being observed with PET activity as the patient was unfit for surgery and had a poor lung function. It progressed after four or five months with some consolidation on the outer aspect. And using PET guidance, we knew we needed to biopsy more the medial side of the lesion. We place a coaxial needle and take some biopsy. We see some pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage, but actually we have no immediate pneumothorax. And a few hours later in recovery, two hours in fact, the patient develops some respiratory compromise, the SADS drop. There is a small uh, right-sided hemoneumothorax. The patient has limited lung reserve, as I said, which is why we weren't aggressive in the first instance. We resuscitate this patient. Uh, chest drain is avoided because the patient uh, uh, becomes uh, asymptomatic and improves. And a week later comes in to clinic. A chest x-ray shows that the lung has re-expanded fully. The diagnosis was confirmed and the patient was referred and in my department and they had a radiofrequency ablation subsequently. So this is another patient with a right upper lobe tumor with lymphangitis or a suspicious tumor, 65 year old with dyspnea. We target this lesion posteriorly from the posterior approach. Four days later, this patient was fine at the time of the biopsy. The immediate CT did not show pneumothorax at all. He was discharged home. He came just to get his histological results. In the medical outpatients, he described some chest pain. They called me. We said, okay, let's get a chest x-ray. We did a chest x-ray. We found a significant pneumothorax. Um, and because of his symptoms as, as well at this time, we took him up to radiology. We place a Seldinger drain in place. The diagnosis comes back it's confirmed as adenocarcinoma. The patient has lymphangitis. The pneumothorax resolves, and then he was placed on chemotherapy. So, 86 year old lady who was being investigated for a thoracic arterial, a thoracic aneurysm, a very large thoracic aneurysm, and was found to have an incidental lesion in the right lung. The family and the patient and the clinicians wanted us to get a diagnosis for this. She was actually, despite her age, a very fit 86-year-old. And in my unit, we are fairly aggressive in terms of stenting if we need to be uh, for the thoracic aorta. So we had difficulty getting the biopsy. It was not a difficult lesion. It was just that the patient was in the, with breathing and breath hold was uh, difficult with cooperation. And we did get the needle in after multiple manipulations. Single pleural puncture, but actually the, within the lung parenchyma, we had different maneuvers. We got a positive tissue, neuro, neuroendocrine tumor, but we did note the patient developed I beg your pardon, an asymptomatic air embolus, uh, which we were lucky that wasn't symptomatic either for the patient or for, us, you know, for the procedure. Lastly, a patient with a left upper lobe lesion Standard um, biopsy technique, CT guidance, as I've explained, some pulmonary hemorrhage is not unusual that you see this, and perhaps the throw of the needle here is a bit too much, and that's why we're seeing a bit more hemorrhage on this side here, and we could have retrieved that bit back. Patient's fine, but in recovery, the patient four hours prior to discharge describes some chest discomfort, pain, and a chest x-ray is done, and you can see a fairly significant pneumothorax there. And under Seldinger technique, we place the chest drain 
This resolved 24 hours later. We kept this patient in and took the drain out afterwards. To conclude, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, lung and missile biopsies are predominantly now performed under CT guidance. It is a safe, technically high success rate, but can have potential major complications. Careful training, assessment, and readiness with management of complications is essential, in my opinion, for good outcomes and results. Thank you. Thank you.